Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and the Harvard Classic Lectures from the Harvard Classic volume number 5, the Emerson volume. This is a brief set of comments on Emerson's little essay, Classic Jewel, called Gifts. Uh, now before we begin lecture 48, I want to make a couple of quick observations that are just introductory in nature. By the way, some people constitute gifts as their favorite essay. Today we'll maybe kind of uh, approach uh, some reasons why. Hey, if you haven't done it and you haven't been following me and you just stumbled onto this lecture, you want to for sure hit my website, learnstrong.net. You want to go down that left-hand side, find the Harvard Classics folder, and at least watch lecture number 35, which is kind of my introductory set of comments on Emerson. And there I'm pointing out what I'll say again, that as we're studying uh, these lectures, these essays, uh, addresses and essays on Emerson, we're asking questions from three perspectives. Emerson is teacher or person, that is to say, um, the kind of person that he is. Um, here in this lecture, for example, we're going we're gonna to invest some time in this notion of Emerson as iconoclast. We'll talk more about that idea in a bit. We're going to look at Emerson in these uh, lectures as a philosopher, an idealist, sometimes called the transcendentalist. We've said that sometimes he really liked that designation. And then we're going to talk about Emerson as artist as craftsman with words. He's an unbelievable creator at what we call in our, in our levels of reading 2B. Um, we're really going to get to enjoy that in this lecture. It's kind of, it's going to be a lot of fun simply because it's a short essay so we can actually read it together. Um, just to remind, our learning theory in 303 speculates that learning is the capacity to connect new information to old information. So we're always asking questions about how we can take um, stuff we've already learned and, add, and join it to in some meaningful way, uh, related to in some meaningful way, the, the stuff we already know. Just to remind our three levels of reading, what does the text say? That's level one, we're summarizing. What does the text mean? That's level two here, we subdivide. 2A, uh, major themes, messages. 2B, we're talking about the rhetoric, not what Emerson says, but how Emerson says it as we, as we read uh, through this essay. We'll be paying particular attention there. Um, and then finally, at level three, um, we're answering the question, how can I relate to this text? At 3A, relate to other texts and to the world in general. And then finally, and most importantly, how do I relate to myself? Um, and Emerson's going to have a few ideas that I think will challenge us, I hope so, as we, uh, as we get into this. Now, before we get there, background information. Um, we, we will have this essay published in 1844. Uh, and uh, which is an interesting year in a number of counts because this will be the year that um, Thoreau will be given some property uh, allowed by, uh, by Emerson, dare we call that a gift, um, to go out into the woods next to Walden Pond and, and, and build his little hut there. We'll have much more to say about Thoreau later uh, in a series of comments on Walden. Emerson was always challenging the status quo. We saw this in earlier lectures, lectures on self-reliance, lectures on uh, American scholar, lectures on compensation. In fact, you can make the argument that every single time Emerson writes, he is challenging the status quo. That is what we call iconoclasm. Icon over related to something holy, a relic, a sacred relic, and then uh, to be iconoclastic means you're iconoblastic, as we sometimes will say. That is to say, he likes to pick up that aluminum bat and just start whacking on things that are considered sacred. For example, giving and receiving gifts. He'll make some interesting ideas, uh, comments about that idea. Now, for background information, a couple of things. Emerson very much has it in his mind. Uh, there's a famous line about a famous story from what we call the Troy tale. When Aeneas is, a, is telling the story in, uh, in, in the Aeneid, and book 2, line 49, it's a very famous line that says, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Now, of course, we're talking in this one about the Trojan horse that is there left uh, at the walls of Troy, pushed into the walls of Troy, and of course we'll explain why Troy will fall. So as Aeneas, the great Trojan, is explaining to Dido what's up, um, he makes this comment, right, you've got to be careful when somebody gives you a gift. Now that will stand behind uh, Emerson's notion of what it means uh, to, to receive a gift. Uh, he also, of course, because he was a Christian preacher, has in his mind the Acts uh, 2035 verse that is attributed actually to Christ that it's better or more blessed to give than it is to receive and in this case uh, I think we're going to see some of Emerson's ideas played out as well the question of this essay let's write it down 
among many, but certainly one of the central questions is, how do you give and how do you receive gifts? Okay. Now this essay is remarkable for its length. It's one of the shortest of all of Emerson's uh, essays. And because it is so short, we're going to have the joy of actually working paragraph by paragraph. Now, um, as you're working through this with me, again, I recommend that you number all six of these paragraphs. We're going to work at level one to begin with, and then we'll, uh, then we'll go through uh, level two and level three. Um, the, the essay actually begins, as many of these essays, essays begin, although sometimes the Harvard Classics doesn't give us the poetic lines that come before the essays, which is why I've kind of not made uh, too much of a comment about this, and I'm going to give it a set of additional lectures on Emerson's poems later. But we'll go ahead and begin with his little uh, four-line offering at the beginning of this essay, Gifts. Uh, gifts of one who loved me, t'was high time they came. When he ceased to love me, time they stopped for shame. There's a bit of irony there as well. Let's read, shall we? Paragraph one. And again, we'll read, I'll pause, we'll make observations. It is said that the world is in a state of bankruptcy, that the world owes the world more than the world can pay and ought to go into chancery court and be sold. In other words, he begins by saying, some people say that the world is seriously jacked up place. Now, this has, of course, always been one of the debates in philosophy, right? Plato will play the same game. This is what we call in our study of Machiavelli's Prince the is ought dichotomy. Don't tell me about the way the world ought to be, Machiavelli will say, but rather tell me about the way the world actually is. And he says it, Emerson says it, people often will say that the world's a jacked up place. I do not think this general insolvency, which involves in some sort all the population, to be the reason of the difficulty experienced at Christmas and New Year and other times in bestowing gifts. Since it is always so pleasant to be generous, though very vexatious to pay debts. Now, this is going to be one of the observations of Emerson. He's going to say, you know, when anybody gives you a gift, now you owe them something, which is kind of problematic. We'll get into it, okay? He continues, but the impediment lies in the choosing. If at any time it comes into my head that a present is due from me to somebody, I'm puzzled what to give until the opportunity is gone. In other words, he speaks for a number of us that say, I know I'm supposed to give somebody a gift, but man, this is really hard to give a gift. How do you know what's the best gift to give and whether the person will like it, etc.? And then it's kind of ironic. He says it, flowers and fruits are always fit presents. Flowers, because they are a proud assertion that a ray of beauty outvalues all the utilities of the world. These gay natures contrast with the somewhat stern countenance of ordinary nature. They're like music heard out of a workhouse. In other words, he says, flowers have this tendency to brighten our day, right? Nature, he says, does not conquer us. Um, and, and this notion of conquer uh, is, is to pamper us. Nature doesn't pamper us, right? We are children, not pets. She's not fond. Everything is dealt to us without fear or favor after severe universal laws. Now, go back to earlier lectures. And we pointed out that one of the central ideas for Emerson is this idea of, those, of that two boxes that he borrows from Plato's Republic. Again, this notion of in the first box we have things that are physical, a beautiful body, beautiful person. And then in the second box we have this concept of beauty, beauty itself, which is not physical, metaphysical. And uh, nature is personified often uh, in, in these essays. And here, when he says nature doesn't pamper us, he's obviously speaking about nature in that second box, right? Okay. He says, yeah, these delicate flowers look like the frolic and interface of love and beauty. Men used to tell us that they love flattery, even though we are not deceived by it, because it shows that we are of importance enough to be courted. Something like that pleasure the flowers give us. What am I to whom these sweet hints are addressed? Fruits, after flowers, now fruits, are acceptable gifts because they are the flower of commodities and admit of fantastic values being attached to them. If a man should send to me to come a hundred miles to visit him and should set before me a basket of fine summer fruit, 
I should think there was some proportion between the labor and the reward. Let's pause at the end of paragraph one and just jot down a couple of ideas. He makes the observation that giving and receiving uh, 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 gifts is always difficult. However, he says, there's two really great gifts you can always think about, flowers and fruit. And he says about both of these that they are representative in some ways of the powers of nature to remind us that, of course, these are grown and they are alive and therefore when they are given, there's something uh, profoundly important about them. Paragraph two. For common gifts, necessity makes pertinences and beauty every day. And one is glad when an imperative leaves him no option. Since if a man at the door have no shoes, you have not to consider whether you, you could procure him a paint box. In other words, some kind of silly gift. If a guy shows up at your house and doesn't have any shoes, and you know the gift you should give him is a pair of shoes as opposed to the kind of silliness of coming up with some gift. And, and, and Emerson says, I kind of like it when I'm kind of forced then to have to give somebody a legitimate gift like a pair of shoes. And as it is always pleasing to see a man eat bread or drink water in the house or, about, or, or out of doors, so it's always a great satisfaction to supply these first wants. One of the greatest gifts you can give, of course, quoting from uh, a, a, a special passage where Jesus Christ said that one of the most important things one can do is to give water to a stranger, right? Gifts. Necessity does everything well. In our condition of universal dependence, it seems heroic to let the petitioner be the judge of his necessity and to give all that is asked, though at great inconvenience. If it be a fantastic desire, it is better to leave to others the office of punishing him. I can think of many parts I should prefer playing to that of the Furies. The Furies in Greek mythology are what torment or haunt you. Next to things of necessity, the rule for a gift, which one of my friends prescribed is, that we might convey to some person that which properly belonged to his character and was easily associated with him in thought. In other words, one way to think about giving gifts is to ask about the individual to whom you're giving the gift. What kind of person is this individual? I want to choose some kind of gift that somehow represents his or her character. But our tokens of compliment and love are for the most part barbarous. Rings and other jewels are not gifts, but apologies for gifts. Now this is already uh, Emerson at his iconoclastic best. <clears throat> He's going to say, there's no point in giving some silly ring or piece of jewelry for a gift. Now, for, of course, our postmodern culture, this, and if you've watched any TV commercials, obviously must be argued. But listen, I mean, hear Emerson out. The only gift, he says, is a portion of thyself. Thou must bleed for me. I, Emerson loves these kinds of lines. you, you got to bleed for me. In other words, when you give me a gift, Emerson says, it better prove to me that you gave something of yourself. Well, how in heaven's name can you do that? Well, he explains it. Therefore, the poet brings his poem. Some of you maybe know somebody that their favorite gift is to write a poem and then give it, right? As opposed to giving other kinds of, uh, of silly gifts. The shepherd his lamb, the farmer corn, the miner a gem, the sailor coral and shells, the painter his picture, the girl a handkerchief of her own sewing. Notice about all of these, people are giving things that they actually care about because they, were, they somehow contributed to their creation. This is right and pleasing. For it restores society in so far to its primary basis when a man's biography is conveyed in his gift, and every man's wealth is an index of his merit. In other words, when you give a gift, you must give a part of yourself. And if you don't have anything to give, then obviously you've got an issue. Several of uh, uh, students in the past have pointed out, this reminds them of that scene in Napoleon Dynamite when he draws the picture for the girl and, he, and, and, and bakes the cake for her as well. And in both of these, he's offering something of himself because he created it, right? It's interesting to point out that in our childhood, we understood this intuitively. For example, when you were very young, if you made something, you always wanted to give it away. It didn't occur to you when you were five to go out and buy from a store for your, 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 your mother or your father's significant other, but rather you wanted to make something. I'm going to draw a picture or whatever. Emerson will say, that's a far better gift anyway. But it's a cold, lifeless business when you go to the shops to buy me something which does not represent your, talent, your life and talent, but a goldsmith's. This is a very interesting idea. 
Why would you go to a diamond or jewelry store and buy a diamond ring or a necklace or whatever, he says, and give it to me? Because that all that shows is the, the brilliance of the artist who made it. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Now notice how Emerson is not getting involved in the economics of this. That is to say, well, dude, if I go out and buy you a $5,000 gift, that tells me how much I care. That tells you how much I care about you. Emerson would argue, not at all. If you really want to get down to it, the only gifts that matter are the ones that you can build, you can create. He says, this is fit for kings and rich men who represent kings in a false state of property to make presents of gold and silver stuffs as a kind of symbolical sin offering or payment of blackmail. And this is an interesting idea. And some of my students have said, I never really thought about this, but it kind of makes sense. If I have money to go out and just buy you something, and so I do, it's altogether possible that you might actually think about that as some kind of a blackmail or a payoff of a kind. If I sit down and I, for example, write you a set of lines and I give those to you, then you are going to feel in some way that this is a significant moment and the exchange is therefore considered so much greater. In my own biography, one of the greatest gifts I ever received was from my daughter who said on a Father's Day, I want to recite a Whitman poem to you that I've memorized. My daughter was quite young at the time and she recited for me, oh captain, my captain. And that moment, I still remember, I can be easily become emotional about that moment because that Emerson would qualify as a true gift. And I said as much to her, I said, Emerson would be proud of you and the gift that you've given to me. There is nothing I can do to repay other than a hug, which of course I gave. Paragraph number three. The law of benefits is a difficult channel, which requires careful sailing or rude boats. It's not the office of a man to receive gifts. Now this is going to be controversial as well. He's going to say, if giving gifts is difficult. Receiving gifts is even more problematic. There are cultures on this planet, we think of course of the Japanese right away, who will argue that it's very, very difficult to receive a gift because the moment I receive a gift from you, I am obligated in some way to you and I never want to be obligated. That's a very Emersonian idea as well. Let's continue and see how he does it. It's not the office of a man to receive gifts. How dare you give them? We wish to be self-sustained. Now this goes back to that idea of self-reliance. The minute you give me something, somehow you're a little bit higher than me or you've obligated me in some way. We do not quite forgive a giver. The hand that feeds us is in some danger of being bitten. These word pictures of Emerson are so brilliant. I'm happy that I'm able to, re to read this whole essay with you. What a great line, right? Uh, in other words, you gotta be careful when you give an animal, so an animal might bite you in, in taking of the gift. We can receive anything from love, for that is a way of receiving it from ourselves, but not from anyone who assumes to bestow. We sometimes hate the meat which we eat because there seems something of degrading dependence in living by it. Then he quotes from a set of lines, Brother, if Jove to thee a present make, take heed that from his hands thou nothing take. In other words, any time Jove gives a gift, there's always something on the other side that's being expected. We ask the whole. Nothing less will content us. We arraign society. We find fault with society if it do not give us, besides earth and fire and water, opportunity, love, reverence, and objects of veneration. Well, this is an interesting idea. Let's, let's kind of unpack it for a moment. He says, when you give me something, you in some ways have become my superior because for you to give me something requires of me that I receive it and in my receiving it then I've somehow kind of allowed you to have a bit of a precedence over me and that troubles me he says why because Emerson is a great believer in self-reliance there isn't anything that you need to give to me that I don't already have with the exception of course he says of love and of course as he's already said this notion of if I can accept in love, then what I'm really doing is I am celebrating the gift that you're giving to me of yourself, and because we are two souls, then the exchange makes total sense. By the way, go back to our comments on Dunn's Valediction for Bedding Morning and this notion of how lovers can understand love of two souls in a fundamental different way than if you think of love as loving the body, right? Paragraph number four. 
He's a good man who can receive a gift well. Note the irony after saying what he said about receiving a gift. He says, a good man, a good person is able, and again, he will use the word man today if he was writing. Obviously, he would use gender-inclusive language. We've said this in other lectures. So please forgive Emerson this fault of his because at the time it wasn't considered a fault. This was just the way he wrote masculine language to describe everyone. But he says about a good person, a good person is able to receive a gift. Let's take a look. He's a good man who can receive a gift well. We are either glad or sorry at a gift, and both emotions are unbecoming. Some people, of course, struggle with how do you receive a gift you don't really like? Um, there are, of course, um, young people who sometimes will receive a gift, and their first question is, can I return it? Some people will see that as real bad form, right? In other words, you should just accept the gifts people give to you and not seek to try to return them. Some violence, I think, is done. Some degradation born when I rejoice or grieve at a gift. In other words, I shouldn't be too happy or too sad about the gift I get. I am sorry when my independence is invaded or when a gift comes from such as do not know my spirit. And so the act is not supported. In other words, if you don't know me well, Emerson says, don't give me a gift. And if the gift pleases me overmuch, then I should be ashamed that the donor should read my heart and see that I love his commodity and not him. In other words, if I'm too excited about the gift, he says, it may suggest to the gift giver uh, that something is maybe lacking in our relationship and I'm more excited. In other words, it, the, the gift giver might perceive me as a user of a kind. He says, and I, I don't like that. That's the use of this word, ashamed, as he's saying. The gift, to be true, must be the flowing of the giver into me, correspondent to my flowing unto him. True friends, he will say, in other words, is poison point. True acquaintances understand that the power of the gift is not in the giving, but in the intentionality behind the giving. And that is what he says he loves, the exchange of soul, if you will. When the waters are at level, then my goods pass to me, to him, and his to me. All his are mine, all mine.